Good morning. Welcome to another installment of our virtual seminar. I'm Michael Barr, the Education Director, and we are very grateful to be brought by our sponsors, Cedar City, Brian Head, and Tourism Bureau, who make this possible. And I'm very excited for today. We're going to learn something. We're going to have fun doing it while we learn. And uh, Brian, tell us, what are we talking about today? Yes, hi, Michael. Uh, again, I, my name is Brian Vaughn. I'm the Artistic Director here at the festival, and I am thrilled to have with us Mr. Philip Thompson, uh, who has served as our voice and text, head of voice and text um, at the festival for many years. Um, and he's been the voice coach, dialect coach, uh, an all around sort of guru for all things text and speech and voice and all the things for many, many years. Um, and I am so thrilled to have him. Uh, Philip is currently the professor of drama at the University of California at Irvine. Um, where we've had a long-standing relationship here at the festival with many, um, many great uh, artists from, from that university, um, and specifically uh, Cameron Harvey, who is a uh, founder of the festival and um, a great um, innovator here at the festival um, in, in many years. Many, he was sort of in the, the triad of Fred and Doug Cook and, uh, and Cam Harvey, and he was um, instrumental there also at Irvine. So Phil is... Um, is there, but he's been with us at the festival since, well, 1999, I think was his first season. And um, we're so excited to have you. You are a guru. We have a lot to unpack today because you're so instrumental in the process here, um, dealing with language-based plays. Um, but you also have just a great background, a great pedigree, and I'm, I'm and just also just an incredible human being. So I'm so <laughs> thrilled to have you, having worked with you many, many times, uh, and leaning on you in every instance. <laughs> going, Phil, help me here. Uh, so Phil, thanks so much for being here. It's great to have you here. Thank you. It's a pleasure. As you say, it's home territory. So I feel very, very welcome with you. Yeah, you know, it's so you know, you've always been like a little beacon of hope and, and <laughs> out there in the dark sometimes listening to these plays and sitting up in your perch up in the upper balcony listening for, you know, all the things that incorporate so much about this work, whether it's, you know, clarity of text, but also imagery in the language or, um, you know, so, so many things. Um, and uh, I know a lot of our company, the history of our company has really have found you instrumental. How did you come into this work? You know, I mean, I know you were an actor. Uh, yeah, I studied at Irvine. Uh, and in fact, I remember having my teacher Dudley Knight go off to do work as an actor there. And so, yes, as you said, I, I trained as an actor. And so I think I knew I had an affinity for language and, uh, I think the first show that I coached was Romeo and Juliet that was done on campus. Uh, I was playing Paris, uh, really the part I was born to play, unfortunately. <laughs> and uh, I, I sort of had surplus energy and Robert said, can you do this work? And the, the moment, uh, Juliet was being played by Rebecca Carey, who's a voice and text coach up at Oregon Shakespeare Festival now. Yeah. And uh, she inverted a line. Juliet's line is, give me, give me, tell not me of fear. Oh, give me, give me, tell not me of fear. And she, like a lot of people I now realize too, just fixed it in her head. Oh, give me, give me, tell me not of fear. And I was sitting, as you say, in my perch, trying to hear the play and it was just, not working and my first impulse was it's a it's a verse question you have to do the meter the way that he told us to and i could see that she and robert cohen were like are you going to be that picky but it all i realized that i was unsettled by this line because what juliet is saying is oh give me give me tell not me of fear buddy don't tell me about fear, I am beyond fear. And when I picked that little thing out, I was lucky to say, here's where the text wrinkles. And you could see on her face and on Robert's face, just, oh, we can use that. And that idea of being able to, not to dictate the text, but to open the folds of the text and let people see how they can use it, 
that was just so satisfying that I never really turned back, that I've been doing that sort of work ever since. Well, that's, I mean, it's so cool that, I mean, even that example is sort of so beautiful about your work, which sort of straddles this idea of not necessarily direction, but there's a dramaturgy element to this. There's a um, investigative spirit really inside the language, which is just finding these key things that are gonna help you, um, you know, with the in, into action essentially, and sort of, yeah. um, do you? How do you view your role in in this instance? Well, first off, I want to know, you know, how you, how you. There's that, but um, I know you're also a teacher. You are uh, an obviously an academic, but um, a practitioner of this work. Um, how do you view your role when 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 you're hired on as a voice and text coach or voice and speech coach? Yeah, I, I want to steal from a, a voiceover artist who has, who gives a good lecture called Give the Salmon to the Bear or Throw the Salmon to the Bear, which was some advice he got as a sitcom actor uh, that his role was to let the funny guy make a joke. And so the funny guy was the bear. He was just throwing the salmon and giving people what they need to do the thing that they're going to do is the heart of it. And I think I was really lucky. One of the first professional gigs I had uh, was caretaker at Cincinnati Playhouse. And I was the youngest person in the room. I was, you know, you can sort of conjecture that I was a little baby faced back in the day. <laughs> and so I just felt that I needed to give people things that would be helpful to them, or I mean, I couldn't dictate. And if if I'd been only in an academic situation, I think I would have gotten used to the authority and I think I would have been a worse coach. Uh, I'm coming around to answer this question. I wanna give one more shout out, which is uh, Scott Kaiser at Oregon Shakespeare Festival coached me when I was an actor at Illinois Shakespeare Festival. And he, I was screwing up the verse and he said very gently, you could absolutely do whatever you want to do, but you might want to do it, he didn't say properly, but maybe you could do the verse and see what that feels like. And I just remember feeling like how generous, you didn't have to be that generous with me. You could have just told me I was wrong. But in <laughs> fact, you sussed out what the role was. You're, I as an actor, no matter, my authority was that I'm the person doing it. Mm -hmm not my age or talent or ability, just it's not gonna happen unless the actor does it. Mm -hmm. And so everything that one can do to let an actor fully embody the text so that the text can do what it's built to do, I think that's the role of the voice and text, voice and speech person. Now that might mean for this character in this world, the accent means that they should say, I like, instead of I like. That little adjustment, that's an offering to an actor within the context of the same way that a costume designer would say, yeah, those, that kind of doublet isn't period and the rest of the period is this, we can't do it that way. So one never supersedes the role of the director or the actor. Uh, we all stand together like a Soviet propaganda poster, looking <laughs> to the art together, <laughs> shoulder to shoulder. <laughs> and then the voice and speech person disappears into the background mm -hmm. because the person who's going to carry it over the sports metaphor is uh, the actor, the director, the stage manager calling the cues, all of that timing is aspirational for me. And so it's definitely like teaching, but in teaching, I have a little bit more authority. Mm -hmm. I dictate a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned, I'm sorry, Michael, you, you, did, you know, the idea of like mentors that you've had in your life, yeah. you know, that sort of guided you along. And that's, that's a recur reoccurring theme we have in all of these panels is the people yeah. that influenced other people and got them into this work. And it's so imperative, I think, in our industry where you, you learn from those before you of what to do, what not to do, and also just a little bit of guidance. And I know that, you know, you mentioned Dudley Knight, who uh, 
for those people who have been with the festival for many years probably mm-hmm. know who Dudley was. You know, he was here as an actor and a voice um, uh, text coach on on a couple of productions. He, I I worked with him in Henry the Fourth Part One. I played Hal to his fall staff. And it was such a monumental moment for me because he was such a sage and so so guiding and um, positive, but also a little bit of a teacher in the process, you know, but but so humble and was an incredibly dynamic human being just all around, both in size <laughs> and, uh, as well as his heart. He had a huge heart, but I know he was a major influence for yeah. you inside this work, so much so that you've now created, you know, your own sort of method or practice or which is called the Knight Thompson speech work. And, um, you know, I, we should let people, you know, you have a website, ktspeechwork.org and um, where you offer workshops and, and certification and so forth. That to me seems unbelievable, you know, that you sort of corralled the influence of both of your ideology inside this work together to create your own type of thinking inside this. How did that all come about? And, um, you know, I know you practice that at Irvine and, and many yeah. universities across the country are also practicing that same, same type of thinking. What was that like and how did you dive into that work? Let me start the story. The story is already in progress when I arrive on the scene because Dudley, Dudley was a little dissatisfied with the way speech work was being taught. And there is a danger in speech work because phonetics, for example, is extremely rigorous and it's very easy to let rigor become rigid. Mm. And he was interested in playfulness and flexibility. And I guess I'd have to say inclusiveness uh, so that people didn't feel that their accent was somehow not good enough. Mm -hmm. And so he was in the middle of coming up with these ideas, testing them out when I arrived as an actor at Irvine, and if you had asked me what, if you were a teacher of this stuff, what would you teach? I probably would have said movement. I probably would have been focusing on stage combat actually. And I showed up and Dudley was the one who had all the information. He was so rich with knowledge. And as you say, incredibly generous and open-hearted. And so I just, unconsciously said, oh, this is where I'm going. <laughs> this is, now this is my thing. Uh, and so I learned all I could from him. I went off and taught elsewhere. And I, based on the nuggets he had given me, the seeds, I started to my mind innovating wildly and coming up with new methods. And it wasn't until 2001 that I came back and realized how much he had actually gone miles ahead of me. So we started doing workshops. Dudley could very easily have called this night speech work. The, really, I think he said, well, you could probably use it for your CV. So it should be called Knight Thompson speech work. And not only that, he invited me into say, no, I don't think that's the right direction. Maybe we should do this. Uh, when it came to giving works in workshops in accent, he said, that's all you. I'm not going to set up the curriculum for that. You tell me. And so he just opened doors again and again. If you look at the website, you'll see that there's a logo and you can sort of make out that there's a K there. And then there's a little T nestled in there gently. So that was, <laughs> He objected strongly to that, but I, I won in the end. And uh, uh, a little T hanging onto a great big K is the way I think about the work still. Mm-hmm. And we're, we're out there teaching teachers, uh, trying, to, trying to offer the useful things that, that we came up with. The, the, what hasn't been said here, I realize, is that Dudley passed away uh, right. and we, I was, when I heard the news, I was opening shows there uh, at Utah. And everything I've done since has really been about building his legacy, developing the work, including doing things that I think he would have said, I think that's a bad idea. Mm -hmm. 
I have recurring dreams uh, with Dudley and they're almost always like a scene out of West Wing where we're walking down the hallway and I'm catching him up on the new things. Oh yeah, and we're doing this. Oh, oh, oh we re rearranged that thing. So <laughs> I feel like he's still in there cooking away. And yeah, he, he was a role model to me. As you said, Brian, he was teaching through presence and experience and, and modeling. Yeah. And, and just to be on stage, this is a performance that I wish I had seen, uh, was the two of you uh, in, in those roles, because you both have such strong voices mm -hmm. that you can get away with things that nobody else could. <laughs> uh, the kind of ease and subtlety that you can build on top of having just an incredibly sharp instrument, that must have been that must have been a glorious performance that could have been heard up in the mountains. So, yeah, it was a very special production, I have to say. Yeah. And working with him, you know, well, the whole cast, but but Dudley especially because we had such a great relationship. And uh, like you, that idea of him kind of taking you under his wing yeah. is very similar for me. Um, and what I love about him is he, like me, has a little bit of a gleam in his eye, yeah. <laughs> a little bit of a devilish spirit, you know, <laughs> um, and could get away with, uh, you know, <laughs> things that were so lovable and wonderful, um, yeah. but a great practitioner. And that's, I think, the sort of imperative thing about that. Inside that is also somebody who really knew what they were doing and yeah. um, was unlocking the text in, in ways that you hadn't thought of with ease and comfortability and naturalism. And I do feel like a lot of your thinking is very much in the same regard that, I mean, is that how you look at this? I mean, I think a lot of people get very, and I'm speaking mostly as far as, you know, young people, especially when they're coming into this work and even some teachers, they are very afraid of it because of the, the they think they need a, a sort of a blueprint on all the technical stuff that goes into the writing, yeah. the poetry of it, the, the rules. And what I've loved about working with you is you identifying those rules, but also letting those rules really embody the person inside of that. Um, I mean, is that your philosophy? I think you kind of touched on that a little I bit. I think but. that's exactly right. But I think we, if we're good practitioners and good theorists, we want to cut nature at the joint. We want to find the thing that's inherent and help to manifest it. Mm -hmm. And so any authority that we have is continually reproven or we don't have that authority. We have to be able to say that I love getting this response from an actor in a session. I could use that. Yes, good, I want you to use it. In fact, Melinda once said to me, I was praising her about some way she was handling some text. And she looked at me like I was messing with her and said, you taught me how to do that. <laughs> you, that's you. And I realized, well, I've been coaching you for years and years and years. I wasn't meaning to teach you the right way to do things. But <laughs> if we both walk together through the same door over and over again, then that's a technique. I think that actors sometimes are worried about the technical because we come to use that word to describe things that are mere technique. But a technique is a way of doing things. And the, the think of the loosest uh, craftsman, somebody who's working from intuition. Well, they're working from a technique of intuition. There's some heuristic, some algorithm that they're running to say, I usually do this because it mostly works and I can tell that it works because of that. I tend to put final consonants on words when I'm outside in a big theater because if I don't do that, I don't get the laugh because people are still processing what the word was. And so again, it's about offering up, offering up ways of, I think you said unlocking the text. And I think that's right because when you open the box, you know that it made sense. You know that it was the right technique because it's manifest in some difference it's, it's palpable. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to text work, 
no, I'll separate this. When it comes to speech work, speech work that merely hits predetermined markers and doesn't actually do the thing that it needs to do to make the text do what the character needs it to do or do what the play needs it to do. I'm afraid we've all heard that kind of Shakespeare before mm -hmm. that it's, boy, that's a nice song you're singing, but I don't feel it. Right. Or you haven't clarified the idea for me. Mm -hmm. well, and I think, I mean, especially, you know, now, I think, you know, now more than ever, it seems that inside of this sort of classical um, box that we'll call these plays, is really about putting a contemporary sensibility inside that, which is yeah. the naturalism that is actually inherent in the text and the language. That's I am the pentameter is the natural heartbeat rhythm of our yeah. of our natural everyday speech. But also encouraging that to come from the individual also makes the stuff just this fabric of humanity where, you know, people come through the work rather than the work sitting on top of them, you know. Um, when that works really well, it does like unlock the plays in ways that you hadn't imagined. I think that's kind of a kind of a broad way of thinking, but I, I do think now more than ever, it's really imperative for us to kind of go, these rules are meant to sort of kind of go, they're there, but you can break them. You can play around with it. If you break them, know why you're breaking it. You know, they're like, just have the sense of like ownership of what that may be within the each moment of as the text is laid out in yeah. front of you, you know? Um, I say this to the students that, that I teach a lot that human beings 400 years ago, they were human beings. <laughs> they, they were hungry, they had desires, they were afraid, uh, they were exactly like you except that they could probably improvise in verse a little better and, and they could kill you with a sword. So they're like you, only just a little better. And if we think about the work we're doing as doing it right to become some other kind of person who is an artificial person, why take that trip? Yeah. Neither though am I suggesting that we should take the language and the given circumstances of the plays and sort of cut through them and replace them with whatever the heck we're feeling that day. Mm -hmm. Because the journey of an actor to the text to become another person, that's part of the magic trick. That it's part of the empathy for the world that we're demonstrating and why people come to theater is that I can say, I'm Leontes and I've talked myself into a really broken way of thinking. And I can feel that in my body and the way I use language. And if I've done that right, it's real and human. I feel it and the audience feels it. Yeah. And a Shakespeare festival is in danger of becoming a museum of mummified ideas. Right. And the, the answer is not to throw out the ideas, uh, but to reanimate them to live in the language. Yeah, I mean, and some of that stuff, I think naturally happens too, you know, I mean, like the the very notion of like, oh, I'm gonna sit outside, this, the text is telling me this right here. Well, I'm gonna go against that. And then when you start doing it, you're like, oh, no, that's there, it, it actually works. And you sort of, you fall into it naturally anyway, you know, or um, which I think is sort of the beauty about the, the sort of scoring of the material, just as a song is the same way, you know, if you don't hit that note sometimes, this is a different song. And, yeah. um, but some of it is just naturally there, inherent in it. And when you are able to identify it, it also can unlock new clues and new choices inside that. But more often than not, you keep coming back to that sort of rhythm because it's our natural rhythm, you know? So I always say for people to not be afraid of it, just get up and start doing it, you know? Um, which is another thing I feel is really great about you and your thinking inside it. You mentioned the body and the movement aspect of that, which is also really imperative. It's one thing to sort of read it. It's another thing to get up on your feet and start speaking it to another person and what your body might be saying in any given moment, you're in a height of rage or, or passively, um, you know, 
unable to move, whatever it may be, you know, um, that all is an indication of how that language is being conveyed or getting out to an audience. Yeah, language is a thing you do to somebody and a thing that gets done to you. It's a thing you do with your body as well as your mind. Right. I, I had this experience. I'm, it's anecdote day. I apologize for this, but <laughs> I'm loving this. So I played Edgar to Dudley Knight's Lear in college and uh, Robert Cohen was the director and uh, I was playing against Jack Greenman, who was playing Edmund and another voice and speech. Text exactly. Person. Exactly. We, we all hung around Dudley and we learned something. <laughs> so I was we're coming up to the line where Edmund says, when so, saw you our father last? And Edgar realizes that there might be something to this story that Edmund is telling him. And Robert said, I want you to laugh. And so I went, okay, I'll, I'll do the thing. Ha 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 It felt artificial, I hated it. And so eventually being a graduate student, I said to Robert, can I not do that thing? Maybe I can't not do your note that you told me to do. And uh, I cut it and then I no longer found the moment where I could believe and be overwhelmed by Edmund. I could not figure, it just was illogical that taking away something artificial made my moment less true. And I finally realized that what was happening is that by laughing, I was exhaling and so when the moment he asked about the father, I had no option but to go. And so this big real breath dropped into me. So the scoring of it made a real event occur in my breath and in my body. And then I didn't have to do any acting because air came into me, his ideas came into me. And that was a revelation. First of all, it was a revelation that I should probably do what Robert Cohen tells me to do. <laughs> Here's another story from that same show. He said, can you say perpendicularly? 10 leagues in all make not up the, the, the thou has perpendicularly fell. And I was like, and so I rolled my eyes a lot. I tried it badly. And eventually he said, okay, stop doing that. Then when I saw you play the role in 99, uh, you said that thou has perp Particularly fell, and you did an amazing thing, which told the story of falling from the cliffs. And I thought, I hate this man <laughs> because he can take a note that I thought was a stupid note and completely make it into something beautiful. So technical things have to be converted into real events and real actions, real ideas that, that come into your body. Otherwise, can, they're just notes. Yeah. Can you can you share with us? First of all, I'm glad you're sharing the anecdotes because they allow us to apply. And I think it teaches the principle that I'm going to ask a question, and I think you're going to respond with uh, there are multiple different ways. But I want our patrons to know what what does your role look like here? What are the tools that you are given in regards to time and when you come into the process and what you do? So table sessions, setting up actor visits, um, uh, sitting. I see you every night in the theater when I go, all in different parts of the theater. And then you dispense what you hear back to them. So I wanna know the tools, patrons to know what the tools are, the processes. And then how do you establish that relationship? Because you have a very brief window of time to build trust with actors for, for the, these type of notes and this direction that you're giving. Um, uh, so what, what are the tools and the process and what does that job look like? And then how do you engage the actor? Uh, because I think there's a lot of teachers and students and actors who go, wow, if I could do that in my process, I could do that type of stuff. So what, what does that look like? So many things. Uh, the first thing is the process at, at the festival is unique for, for me because I'm in residency. Mm -hmm. the, there's plenty that I could be doing. I could sit in my apartment. <laughs> I, I could go hiking, but I'm here. I'm, I'm in the world and there's no other place that I would want to be and no other distractions from my life. So I'm in the room. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'm a scarecrow. Mm -hmm. We're 
doing a, a play which has received pronunciation or a British accent, and the actor says, I'd like to ask, ask you a question. So I get checked to see that my note is still there in my presence. But the presence, is, the fact that you're there, <laughs> um, it, it empowers the, the actor. There's a sense of authority there. I've, yeah. I've got to, uh, Phil's in the room. I got to make sure I'm doing that, right? That's, and Brian mentioned that I'm perching up in the worst seats. Mm -hmm. Even if I'm checking my email, I never do that. Uh, even if I'm doing something else, <clears throat> the actor knows that I'm there. And so, mm -hmm. I mean, in a way, what's the role of a director? One part of the role of a director is to be the, reason that you all have to gather at that time on that day mm -hmm. they I have to show up and that person says they hired me so I do the thing now mm -hmm. and there is a sort of organizing the grit that makes the pearl that is the presence of a vocal coach can I just can I write a book with everything you say by the way <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh man you will have more I'm success than me me writing books so yes <laughs> yeah amazing anyway so, so yeah, we, we're there to, to be physical evidence that it's important. Mm -hmm. that, that's, I could say the first and foremost thing. When it comes to what the process is, <clears throat> I do often interact with directors and dramaturgs beforehand to mm -hmm. say, I love that cut, except you seem to have cut the verb out of the sentence and that's gonna be hard to act. So there's, there's some of that intervention beforehand. Mm -hmm. And then I'm, as you say, in the room looking at the text, which is something that no other person in the process really has a, an ability to do. Mm -hmm. They have the ability, they don't have the time to just be watching along saying, hold on, you seem to be putting a, period there, but it's actually a colon in the folio text, mm -hmm. and that might mean something different. Mm -hmm. So there's a sort of making sure that the text is accurately performed, that is to say that it's either what's in the text or what we decided should be in the text. Mm -hmm. and, and there is some way in which all of that work is, when I'm training people to be coaches, or when I'm mentoring them is probably a better way of putting it. A lot of people know what note to give, mm -hmm. or they know, they hear the note, like, mm, that's a problem. But they're not always so good at knowing when to give it. Oh, well done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, oh, I could give this note. He inverted those two words again, but he's also dealing with that costume and he's going to be mad <laughs> if, I, uh, if I tell him, and so being careful with people about where you nudge is a big part of it. Yeah. You mentioned sessions. We do then, this is another, I think, great thing about the way the festival works is that there's the secondary rehearsals that can be requested and scheduled. So there's an octopus who does all of that magic this equity actor has, has this many hours, they're in rehearsal here, so you can have them for half an hour. <clears throat> Pardon me. So then I get those sessions. And honestly, it, seem, it might seem tedious. It may seem tedious to the actors, but we sit down, they say their words. I go, mm -hmm. hold on, go back to that one. Yeah, you're pronouncing it dull which is a very Western thing to do, but I'm trying to nudge everybody towards saying dull instead. Sometimes I make those nudges uh, or <laughs> you're stressing that word, but just so that we're clear, that's counter to where the stresses are landing in the, in the verse. What Scott Kaiser said to me. Also though, because we're covering everything, and almost always I have enough time then to hear the words spoken by every actor in all of their words in a room, in a chair. Now, if somebody's playing Hamlet, then there's less time to do that. Mm -hmm. And then it's more, let's have a session. Mm -hmm. And 
here, let me, let me go to Quinn in Hamlet. That was recent. He didn't need me to tell him what the structure of the language was or how she, he should pronounce things. But there was this moment in the uh, Oh, What a Rogan Peasant Slave where it all builds up to vengeance. And he was aware that he was kind of straining there vocally. Mm -hmm. And so we worked technically on where are you getting those breaths and how do you hit some kind of peak without too much strain at the larynx? And, and that in, in the sense of technical as being mechanical only, I knew and he knew that fixing the pathway of how I breathe and so forth up to that moment would make it possible for the idea to occur. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm in the room, I'm noticing things and I'm thinking, oh yeah, I think that would be a good intervention that's a vocal intervention, mm -hmm. or I'll just give this note, mm -hmm. or, or I'll, I'll tell Brian Vaughn, you could actually be quieter. <laughs> just a little, <laughs> <Finally>. <laughs> So <laughs> that was one of the marvelous things about your Hamlet, by the way, was your ability to be just intimate in a big outdoor theater mm -hmm. that because you could ping things to the back, you were able to be more soft and we could lean into you. And it was, I mean, I didn't believe it. <laughs> I, I think you didn't believe it. Like, no, you could be quieter. Yeah. You could, the, the bottom is lower. So, so in that way, being in the audience, I'm being the audience. Yeah. And I don't look at the stage much. I look at the text or I close my eyes. I don't do that much anymore because when actors see that my eyes are closed, they think I'm sleeping. So <laughs> only when I think I can get away with it. But yes, in, in production meetings then, when there are conversations about visual things on the stage, I'm clueless. Right. I, I, they're talking about the orange trees. Are there orange trees in this play? <laughs> or I'll say to an actor, you can make the antithesis between this idea and that idea clearer. And they say to me, is it not enough that I'm pointing at the things? And I say, <laughs> oh, no, actually, yeah. Because I do think that I am responsible for, the, for making sure the, the radio play is a good radio play. Well, you're so good at that. I mean, I should note, you know, you've worked on over 100 productions here at the festival over the many years that you've yeah. been here. And not all of them have been Shakespeare, uh, you know, uh, also. I know you also deal, you mentioned RP and, you know, plays that deal with British dialect or other dialects inside this work also. And that adds another layer of some complexity on yeah. top of some of these plays. You know, I, I think of my own personal experience working with you on Stones in His Pockets, David and I working with you on that play where it's two actors playing multiple characters, Irish, English, you know, American. And you were so great in how the physicality of the mouth and um, could help convey a different sound or a character inside of that. And um, I just loved that guidance because it, it, but it started at the neutral, which was me, me playing Charlie, that's Brian, that's my center. And then inside that are all these other characters that you're playing that you have to convey through physicality, but mostly through language. And, you know, you're dealing with an Irish dialect or um, different regions of Ireland. Um, and then you have a British director and like you were so really good about saying things like, well, this character may live in this part of your mouth, the front part of your mouth, or maybe Clem sits back. He's a little, you know, the English director and kind of a Richard Attenborough type, you know. You know I'm just remembering they, the character who I enjoyed immensely. Yes, but um, some of those little clues inside of that were so great, along with this dialect work, which was also another thing which can be daunting sometimes of how to convey sound or um, to make it 
believable that here me this American actor is playing somebody from you know Dublin or wherever else you know um how do you what is your thinking inside of some of that work you know because I think you're really good about that um with within the same sort of rules that apply to sort of Shakespeare you know the text yeah. but then on top of that is like a sound that is completely different um you know yeah I think it's really it's very similar I think you're absolutely right that the relationship that, that I hope I have with the text, with the accent, with the actor is flexible. And part of it is, so part of what Knight Thompson's speech work is, is a very detailed methodology for working on accents. And so I'm gonna avoid going into the full multi-point lecture. So language, is at least on one level, a gesture. It's a physical performance. And so we often talk about the posture of an accent. And that word is deliberate because your physical posture, we all understand that various kinds of posture have an impact on your gait. You walk differently because you hold your head in a certain position. And so the relationship between a configuration and a moving dynamic flow is the relation between specificity and gestalt, the, the whole. Mm -hmm. In a way, we shouldn't be able to do accents. They're far too complex. You know, if I say in that Northern Irish accent, the word mouth is pronounced mouth, then you immediately know that down is pronounced with the same vowel. Mm -hmm. And not only do you not have to be told that, you don't even have to tell yourself that mm -hmm. because you can collect all of those specific targets, that the sound that you're trying to get to, you can gather them together in a feeling. And it's very much, my tongue is, like the minute I pull my tongue back and the root of my tongue goes back, my imagination says, oh, I know what you're doing. Here, let me help. <laughs> and, you know, you can, if, if I were to pull my tongue back and get like this going on, I'm like one step away from Australian. Like I could talk like this and I'd have, almost entirely the same shape, but a tiny little adjustment shifts me from that into that. And that, because I'm looking on the outside, I kind of know what those pathways are. There's all sorts of detailed linguistics knowledge. It's always fun to drop a term of art, but the actor immediately knows. And that makes my job one of giving nudges to make sure that the there's an emergent property for the actor or that I can give an actor something like I'm having trouble doing the accent. I lose the accent at this point in the scene when I get angry. If I can figure out, oh, you're going to that sound because you're tending to lift your, lift your shoulders or let me give you a couple of ways to be angry in French then you're going to be able to, it'll be self-generating. Right. And that's what's essential. All of these techniques, all of the esoteric detail of, no, that's a voiced by labial fricative, not a labial <laughs> velar approximant, th then those details are for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's for my students as well. I'm trying to give them some sort of metacognitive framework so that they can fix themselves, but in the room for an actor, we're making together a bespoke set of cues. We know if they're working because they're working. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then, and so, yeah, for, for you in that role, for you and David, to be able to say, I'm talking in this way, and then I'm talking in this way, that little, that's everything, everything reconfiguring. Yeah. And you can't name the fall of every sparrow Right. But 
my students in their movement work do contact improv and it's really useful and you can sort of see it in the, all the Irvine actors are kind of loose in a wonderful way. And so I often use this metaphor with them. If you stop and think while you're rolling over somebody's back, now what am I gonna do next? What you're gonna do next is fall on your head. Right. Because you have to be working with the thing that's occurring. Gravity is still having a conversation with you while you're moving. And so an actor, I mean, you can see if an actor runs up against a difficult accent trouble or what did Phil tell me the structure of that was, mm -hmm. that's not helpful. It'd be better to just say, good job. <laughs> But yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I've often used that metaphor about, you know, I, I think it's even in Copenhagen, the great play about, you know, nuclear vision and, uh, but there's an analogy in there about skiing, you know, where you're going down yeah. a hill, when you're just going, you're in, in flow and you're moving and the minute you start thinking about the turns or the bumps in front of you, you fall. And that's a similar thing, which is yeah. the key in acting. I mean, I, I, that's sort of the, the whole point is living in the moment, you know, in the now of it all. Um, and you're right, like sometimes it can be overwhelming to think, oh, I'm mispronouncing this word or this dialect is not really in the pocket here right now yeah. because then you've missed the five moments that have happened because you've been thinking about <laughs> the moment where you messed up yeah. and that's really hard and there is a, a sense of like sometimes you, you have all the rules you have all the blueprint and then you just have to kind of go it's like learning to swim or ride a bike or whatever it is you know the rules you know how to do it and then you just gotta at some point go and learn by doing and keep going um to that end i want to ask you about how important how vital is it for students of this work to sort of be familiar with like the phonetic alphabet and you know that oftentimes is is how these notes sometimes will get relayed from voice and text coaches about scoring the text or think of this sound inside that. Um, some people I think are better at it than others as far as actors. Uh, how important is that for you? I think for a student going through the process of learning, the way we do it is you learn all the sounds that are used in human language. So, you know, you might say, well, I am not going to speak Hosa so I don't need to learn how to do the, but having learned it, you've learned something about where everything lives. You've got a system. But then the only time I ever use phonetics in a note at Utah Shakes is for myself. And there's an initial question, shall I write what it should be or shall I write what they said? Mm -hmm. And I really finally came to I'm gonna write it the way I expect it to be. And then the actor is gonna walk up to me with their piece of paper and say, what does this say? <laughs> What's the <this> symbol? <laughs> exactly. It's not necessary for me, it's not necessary for me to have actors who can read phonetics easily. In fact, it's necessary for me that they not worry about it. Mm. And people, there are variations in how people might write. If somebody studied Skinner, they'll have slightly different symbols and it doesn't matter. What, what matters is that we're talking about something specific. So, so I have the luxury, particularly because I'm in residency there, to be able to, to model the sounds. So in a way, I'm giving that note to myself. Together with, as you say, what you're saying is lot, and I want you to say lot, which involves your lip corners going forward quickly, lot. And I hear what you're doing and you're not quite moving your lip corners forward fast enough and then relaxing. So I have to be able to show my homework because the actor needs to, out of that, find the thing that they can use to execute it. I mean, when, when I coach at South Coast Rep, which is, has a lot of actors coming down from LA, I record the notes. Mm -hmm. So I take my notes and then I say, hi, Brian, I have a note on page one, the following. And because they're in a car for an hour and a half minimum. And so th that's the best way for them to get notes. Yeah. For my students, I tend to give phonetic notes because they should be working. 
Uh, I want them to exercise that part of their brains. Yeah. Well, I, I found those recordings and, you know, now you have even more advanced technology to yeah. really break down the sound. And like when we were working on Iliad, that was just like so imperative for me <laughs> to get that stuff, just hearing it over and over and then slowing it down yeah. so to really break down some of the sound inside that. Um, that was really, really um, instrumental for me. And uh, so I, I, I understand that because sometimes hearing it, you can kind of begin to implement it naturally, uh, yeah, how yeah. it should sound, you know. I mean, how, how do you learn choreography? You learn it in your body. And if, if you're always forgetting to kick your left foot out, it's probably because you have your weight on your left foot. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be finding the way to map the story of the sound and being able to slow audio down is uh, remarkably, <laughs> if they hadn't invented it, I would be in trouble. Uh, and you can, again, with easily accessible technology, slow things down. Here, I'm going to speak anti-technology for a moment. What often, though, will happen is if I don't have a good audio sample, I'll record myself speaking it slowly. Uh, like I had to teach some Greenlandic for a play a play that my wife wrote and she was like, sure, Phil can do this. I'll put <laughs> Greenlandic in this play. So <laughs> the, the phrase was Kano repeat, Kano repeat. And so I couldn't get a sample that was good enough. So I did it myself. And it was a reminder, it sort of popped up into my mind. You know, what's a good computer? My brain. <laughs> <laughs> and I can slow it down because I've, taken it on board as a holistic performance for myself. Yes. Mm -hmm. This gets to something that I, I that hasn't been said that I sort of wanted to point to, especially, Michael, because of your question for patrons about what the process is like. I am not an actor in that context. I have acted, I may act again. It's not a thing that I'm, that isn't part of my identity but I'm using my actor as a modeling software. Mm -hmm. And so I have to be able to say, okay, the line is now I am alone. And I could stress it there or how quiet could I be at this moment or all of those things I'm running in my own model but I have to do that so scrupulously that it's not, you know, if I was playing this part, I would totally do it this way. <laughs> what I have to be able to say is, if Michael Barr was playing this part, I think, what, how if, I, if I'm him for a moment and I'm gonna use his energy for this? Yeah. Because an actor and a director have to be able to look at me and say, this person's my assistant, they're helping me not they're my competition. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, just in terms of humanity, that's a good position to, to be in. Mm -hmm. But my work won't happen if, I said this to, to somebody recently in a conversation about dealing with students and making sure that they felt a sense of trust, that they could trust you. Right. And I said, the first thing you have to do is be trustworthy. Yeah, you should start there. <laughs> and so because I have to avoid getting up in, here's a good Leslie Brock quote. I think she would approve. I won't say which director was giving her a note. And she said, hold on, are you getting up in my actor bag here? <laughs> and, uh, and that was absolutely most perfectly stated the, the fear, the caution, the righteous caution that an actor has. Are you trying to run my performance in your own head? Mm -hmm. But I have to do that. So I have to be some sort of killed virus form of an actor. Like, oh, it's, he's like an actor. He has an actor brain, but he's using that in service of the work. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, Brian, do you want to do that question from Jenny? Yeah, sure. Jenny asked, <laughs> someone in the chat in the Q&A, uh, asks, can this advice about text to voice be reversed to serve writers 
of plays or literature in selecting the words they use? I absolutely believe that the best writers are the, the sort of linguistics term is, is iconicity. Mm -hmm. uh, words have iconicity. So if you say spang, it's a kind of a sharp, harsh thing. And if you say blorp, it's a round thing. <laughs> and, and so uh, Ophelia, one of my students was working on this recently and she had like sweet bells jangled out of tune and harsh, possibly out of time and harsh text. And what I was trying to get her to see, what I easily got her to see because she was very smart is like sweet bells, sweet bells jangled out of tune. The juxtaposition of sweet bells and jangled is the image that she's both seeing, reliving, experiencing, trying to grapple with to deliver it. And so on that level, on a sort of close reading of the text level, I think you only get that kind of texture of language with your own body and your own spirit. Mm -hmm. You feel what it's like. My wife is a playwright and so she is frequently sort of saying lines, running lines. The reason that you have a reading during the development process is so that you can, not so you can hear the text, so you can feel the text. Mm -hmm. So that's one level of it, that finding the texture and the sort of function of the language, the action of the language is, it's real good writing. It's what <laughs> people like. But also you have to be able to embody, especially for a playwright, you have to be able to do the thing that the character is doing in a way so that you can discover what your response is to it. I mean, why are there so many actors who go on to be playwrights like Dominique Morisseau? That it's because that's, you're building all those skills as an actor. Right, yeah. Um, I, I have a question and I know we're getting close to time here. Uh, that's okay. I canceled my meeting that was right after this. Okay. So I've got all the time in the world. Uh, th th this could be a fastball. This could be just a slow lob and you go, oh, great. Um, but because you live in the world of language and metaphor so much, um, uh, if you were to describe your role through some of your favorite metaphors, what would you choose for that? I mean, as you've been talking about this, you're, for me, you're that angel sitting on my shoulder that angel who goes, you might want to try it this way. Occasionally, and, I'm a devil. <laughs> I was going to say, a little, <laughs> little Lancelot Gabo there sometimes. <laughs> so, so what is, what is uh, and, and then number two, which is harder, the second part of the question, once you've identified that, if you could control all theater processes in the world, Phil Thompson would never want to do that because he's not like that. But if he I don't could, have the mental energy. No, but if you... Uh, uh, what would that perfect process look like? I'm sorry to ask that at so close to the hour, but I, I do think there's many processes that could learn from you saying, you might want to try it this way. So metaphor, and then what would you do? So one metaphor that I, that I haven't used to death yet is in some ways I'm like the scrub nurse. Mm -hmm. The surgeon says scalpel or just puts out her hand and I'm like, there you go. Do it, <laughs> go do the thing. It's a, it's a service. Voices are delicate. People are sensitive, especially if they're actors. Uh, one metaphor I use for voice in a big theater is it's like a, a cannon flower, a cannon that shoots flowers you gotta get that flower all the way to the back of the theater, but it's a flower. So you have to get the right amount of energy behind it to move it without crushing it. And I love that. Yeah, it's, it's gorgeous. The only problem is it could be a flower, a cannon filled with flour for like baking flour and then the <laughs> metaphor falls apart. But essentially, actually some voices are like that because they're mm -hmm. got plenty of energy behind them, but they diffuse. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one thing about the Engelstad that 
for lower voices, it's actually, there's some seats where it's hard to hear those voices because they're diffusing. Anyway, I'm off topic. So yes. And then if you could change the world, and I know we've got a limited amount of time, yeah. what, what would you encourage theater makers uh, in their process, how to use a, a, a voice and text individual? Uh, I asked Jim Sullivan uh, for advice to give my actors. And uh, again, I think he won't mind if I, if I share this advice. Tell them it's not always about them. <laughs> <laughs> and that's really, really good advice. It's, it's often and legitimately absolutely about you. But sometimes the way you come to work mm. it ought to be, how am, I, how am I adding to your process? How can I make you, how can, I, how can we together go at this play? In dealing with your fellow actors on stage, I find actors are sometimes way too polite with each other. Just in terms of the timing of cue pickup, for example. Are you done with your line? Okay, good, I'm gonna pause for a moment and then I'm gonna do my line. Instead of like, I might overlap you. Mm -hmm. That there's a sort of aggressiveness, rambunctiousness that gets kind of filtered out of the process because we're kind to each other. Now, I'm a big fan of kindness. So building the structure in the re rehearsal process where you can afford to be reckless and even kind of challenging to each other. And that's very difficult. Like the emergence of intimacy coaching is going to make some of the most terrifying, arresting theater that would never have arrived through an older model of saying, let's just make it hard. Let's just make it, let's not talk about anything, but just do hard stuff. So I'm not advocating challenge for challenge's sake, but actually as much conversation and trust building as is necessary to let actors do things that are terrifying and reckless. And for the coach or for the actor working with the coach, making it not about you, but about the work, making it possible to try something stupid. It's very difficult, but that's the most important thing because you're trying to capture lightning in a bottle. You're, you're, trying, to, you're trying to make cold fusion in a magnetic bottle. It, you have to make a space that allows for ferocity. Mm -hmm. And if you can do, I mean, you better do that with Shakespeare because that's some ferocious stuff. But you have to make the space of kindness so that you can say, are we gonna do this thing? Let's do it. At, that's what I like. The only thing really I like about sports is how people are so confident in doing things that would kill me, <laughs> that, that, that they're, they've worked their way up to a level of trust so they can be fierce and reckless in a way uh, because they know somebody's got their back. Well, it is good. I mean, I kind of go back to that idea that it's argumentative speech, you know, it's sort of like you pick up on what the other person says more often than not in almost all of Shakespeare's language and sometimes yeah. using, you know, taking a word and then using that word in another context all the time. And it does keep that sort of forward momentum, that aggressive sort of um, my point of view, your point of view, uh, which you know obviously creates the inherent conflict in the whole thing. But yeah, the muscularity of that when it's really dynamic uh, does make these things just really, you know, pop. Uh, I mean, it's why we don't just sit in our apartments and come up with the performances and then go do them. Yeah, we have to have some time in the room wrestling with the people we're going to be wrestling with. Yeah, one of I have to give you one of my favorite Jim Sullivan notes because okay. <laughs> he's good about that. And David Ivers will share this with me because we talk about it all the time. Is Jim will come up to us and say, "Hey, you know that moment? Did I tell you how good you were in that moment?" And you say, "No, I don't. I don't believe you did." And he'll go, 
think about it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just a little, you know, self-check. Oh yeah, I need to maybe rethink that moment. <laughs> Did I tell you how good you were there? No, you didn't. Think about it. Interesting. Yeah. I am gonna see if I can get away with that. Yeah. But not I, all I wanna, of us can do Jim. On a closing a note, I, I do want to ask you, and I know we're past time as Mike said, but you've worked on so many of these plays and many of these plays more often than not. Is there a play that you're dying to do? Um, that you have well, I, I have a bucket list since there are some that I haven't done. I've, I've never actually worked on Julius Caesar. Oh, wow. I think that's odd, but I haven't. And I haven't done Henry VIII and I think we know why. I haven't ever coached Pericles, but I directed Pericles. And Pericles is a play that I'm really into. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just so, it's reckless storytelling. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's also like rehearsal, Shakespeare's rehearsal for other great scenes. Uh, but honestly, when I come back to a play like Twelfth Night or Lear, I could just keep going back to the same place. It's new every time. Mm -hmm. uh, so my bucket list is things I want. It's the way I play video games. I need to do every challenge. Uh, so I have to complete the list of achievements, uh, but there isn't one that I haven't worked on that is like, I'm not gonna answer the question well, but when I worked with you on Hamlet, that was the first Hamlet I had ever worked on. I'd not been associated with the play before and I was a little scared of it. And that experience was glorious because it was all fresh mm. and it was, we were working at a pretty high level. So I was able to really experience the play. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there are a lot of Hamlets waiting out there for me to have a fresh experience with. Wow. Yeah. But I managed to get through the whole history cycle, thank you. Uh, and uh, there's just a handful. I've never done all's well either. But yeah, I want to finish my bucket list. Cool. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's great. Well, you're amazing, Phil. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I you catch know, you. I mean, there are, so, there, like I said, there's a lot to unpack and some things we didn't get into, like, you know, like vocal health is another thing that I think is something that comes up quite frequently, especially with yeah. us here in the dry desert and zero humidity and and fires know, long run and people. Yeah, yes. But uh, what I've always appreciated about you and uh, is the notion of breath and breathing through it. And I always feel like that's such a I'm doing it right now a great reminder for us all and in, in our world that is filled with a lot of anxiety and angst yeah. and even fear inside this work just having that as a as a sort of leveler is always really beautiful and i just am grateful that you approach the work in that regard because it does kind of ground us all as people and especially in this work that sometimes can be daunting and overwhelming and also um um you know revealing um and uh so yeah it's I, it's I, an I, impulse we all have to freeze and that's never going to work out yeah yeah, definitely helps open, you know, and a, a theater is definitely about vulnerability and people putting themselves yeah. out there. And sometimes that can be really daunting and scary. And you're such a great sort of guide with that as a nurturing spirit in the process and collaborator. So I just thank you for that personally, because uh, you're a very dear friend, but so many, so many experiences wouldn't have been possible without you sort of just being there to kind of believe, help, help one believe in themselves. And I know I speak for many people uh, in that regard. So, um, and our audiences for the clarity and the, you know, power and emotion for that little voice up in the dark, who's <laughs> <laughs> helping us along. Uh, I, I thank you for the work and, um, people should definitely check out the night, um, Thompson speech work. It's a pretty great program. And, um, you know, it's great. Yeah, you can go to the website and there are, there are webinars so you can watch people other than me talk about amazing stuff related to voice and speech. Wonderful. Cool. Um, this, this is one for the ages. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna, before, uh, um, thank you for richly blessing us over all the years, but uh, 
I, I love, I just love your embrace of language. And uh, this, this, I've been fed this morning a lot. <laughs> really, really, really wonderful. So uh, I just want to thank you. Thank you for that. And look forward to other conversations. I thank you both for giving me a home for so long. I, I did the math a while. I think I've lived in Cedar City for five years. <laughs> if I just put the months together. So uh, I feel at home. Yeah. Well, and you've, you know, you've stewarded a lot of other people inside this work too, you know, which we should recognize. We've had a lot of voice and text coaches along with your great work and they've all been really, really instrumental to the process and um, just really terrific people that has been guided by you, you know, um, uh, and, so pretty and special. Part of, our, part of our goal for these things is not just to lift the curtain up to see the man behind the curtain. That's not what it's about. It is not an accident that, that when you see a show on the stage and that Shakespeare speaks and you hear it and you understand it and it speaks to you. Um, it's because of all of that lightning in a bottle work that was done prior to that. And so I'm really grateful that we have spent at least an hour trying to articulate how th there are processes that help us get closer to that, that muse and that magic and sharing that. So thank you. Um, I want to uh, invite you to join us next week, patrons. Uh, first of all, thanks to the Cedar City and Brian Head Tourism Bureau for making these conversations possible. You can find them at bard.org. Go down to the bottom of our front page on the website and you'll find virtual festival. And all of these conversations and others like them are happening there. You can also go to our YouTube channel where you can grab the YouTube and you can subscribe to that and be a part of that. You can listen to it, podcast, exercise, et cetera. You can, you can listen to them at that time too. Next week, we're going to be talking about a very exciting process. We're talking about our Shakespeare in the Schools touring production which has just celebrated its 26th year and uh it's going to be very very fun we actually are going to be doing a julius caesar a virtual uh, julius caesar which we'll talk a little bit about but the process is going to be myself bryant and other people who have been involved in that team talking about what it takes to take that show out and perform in correctional facilities in large gymnasiums and little intimate places on navajo reservations or different places like that i think you'll really enjoy that so uh, thank you very very much and we will see you. Thanks. Thanks, Phil. Thank you.